All right, this is going to be a video response to a user named Seely or Sele S E L A Y 47. It's a user I'm not at all familiar with. I don't ever recall having seen him uh, before. Apparently, he's from the UK. I just happened to do a random YouTube search on the term libertarian, and today, uh, and uh, his video came up. The title of his video, which I'll put a link to, is "Politics: The Status Straw Man." Um, his video really wasn't about that. His video was about something a little bit more interesting, actually. It was mostly a discussion of uh, health care. And he laid it out that uh, he's from the UK, and he really can't imagine that there'd be any debate about there being universal health care, the, the NHS as it is in the UK, and that it was a revelation to him to find out that things are different in the United States, although... Uh, I think, based on watching his video, that he's not quite aware of how much they're not that different. Um, the U.S. system is not based on the ideology of Ayn Rand. That's certainly the case. Um, in any event, he um, refuted the argument. He said he had a libertarian friend in the U.K., so cheers for that. There's not many of them. So uh, I'm glad he has a friend who is a libertarian, but his argument that he went and what which makes up the body of of his video was that uh now I'll try not to laugh here because it's uh obviously it is necessary for the government to institute national health care and the reason this is true is because the government has stepped in to do the, this so it's axiomatic there's a sort of um determinism here where if the government is doing something uh, then it is necessary that the government do this. And he says the government exists to solve problems in society that uh, the re that can't be solved except through government. And so anything that the government's doing is something that couldn't have been solved some other way. Now, I don't agree with the idea that that's what government exists to do. But even if we did accept it, let's just say that there are some things that, gov that only government can do. This is not something I agree with, but let's just accept that. It wouldn't logically follow that everything governments do are fulfilling that, because there could be any number of things that government isn't necessary to do, but it still does, and it would be an open question of whether that's a good idea or not. <laughs> now, let's look at this logically by by the argument that uh, you put forth Saley Seely 47 every single government action ever in the history of the world regardless of government is justifiable and totally defensible because every single action every government has ever done the government did and so therefore by your logic by your refutation of a free market in healthcare the government had to do it. If the government does something, it's because there's a problem that couldn't be solved. For instance, let's say that the government wage raises the wages of politicians, something that governments are wont to do on fairly regular occurrence. Now, a normal person might say, well, that's not necessary. Politicians don't need a raise, whatever their previous rate was. Society can exist without that. But your logic is that, no, if they had never given themselves a raise, that would be one thing. But if they do, then that proves that it was necessary. You know, the government only does things that society can't do on its own. And so the fact that they have given themselves a raise is proof that they were solving a societal problem that only they could solve, and there we have it. And that is just the tip of the iceberg. Um, let's just focus on the UK now. So the UK, it was necessary for them to slaughter millions and millions of Africans, including not just black Africans, but white Africans, a la the Boers, uh, in innumerable colonial wars. And that was all justified. That needed to happen because... The government did those things. The government enacted policies and sent armies out and had puppet dictators and set up monopolistic trading companies like the um, uh, Northwest Company or the East India Company, British East India Company, and 
the fact that it did those things proves that it was necessary to do those things. That, that's circular reasoning. And not only that, if we look at it consequentially, it's terrible because then everything the government has ever done, and this is any government anywhere, there's no clause in your logic that would somehow um, exempt the most terrible things. So when uh, British agents, say, deposited smallpox infested blankets in North America as they did in the aftermath of the French and Indian War during Pontiac's Rebellion and several other occasions and killed, intentionally killed, tens of thousands, not hundreds of thousands of Native Americans, mostly women and children in their villages, that was perfectly acceptable. You can't question that because the government did it and so it was solving a societal problem that only the government could solve. So crazy libertarians are out of line to talk about this. And you say, oh, that's all in the past. Well, there's a lot of history with England, so that's easy to point to the previous outrages, for which England really has more than its fair share. Uh, but we can even look at modern times, look at something like the Olympics. It's not a big tragedy, but... Um, if, say, a libertarian said, you know, I'm against, I don't think that London should have spent all this money on the Olympics. As far as I'm aware, by and large, the Olympics are money losers in terms of all the tax money that goes into infrastructure or whatever. You, you don't get repaid in tickets and uh, additional commerce. But you would say that is a baseless argument because it doesn't matter if they lose money on taxes or gain money on taxes. The fact that the government, and in the case of the Olympics, I don't know if it was the British Parliament or if it was London, the London city government or what. Uh, it's irrelevant in terms of the debate here, though. That uh, the fact that they got the Olympics to come there, it means that it was necessary. Society needed it. They did it. And how do we know society needed it? What's the rubric to decide that society needs something? Well, the government did it. Hence, society needed it. So... The government of Great Britain had to invade Iraq. The society in Great Britain had to invade Iraq in 2003. We know this. There's no debate about weapons of mass destruction or terrorism or what did Saddam Hussein have to do or not have to do with a threat to the United States slash Great Britain. That's all irrelevant. The UK government under Tony Blair aided the United States more so than any other country with direct military intervention, a direct aggressive war in the Middle East for, in the case of in England, who knows how many time in the last hundred years, and it is justified because they did it. And the same is true with Afghanistan. The same is true in Libya and in Syria now, more than likely. Uh, so this should key you into the possibility that maybe your logic here is a bit faulty. And it's not just a bit faulty, it's very faulty. Now, I would offer a counter-explanation. It is incredibly naive and counterfactual to believe that the, gov the actions of the government are manifestations of society trying to fix its own problems, or that that's the primary motivation. Look, for instance, like the first example I used something not as dramatic as slaughtering millions or hundreds of thousands of people, something that the U.S. government does quite frequently and that the U.K. government has a long and glorious history. Uh, look at the first one I brought up was Parliament, let's say, voting to increase their own pay. Would you say that that is evidence that society needed Parliament to be paid more and that the government is simply manifesting that? Or would you say that members of Parliament are at least to some degree, maybe we can debate how much and maybe it varies from individual, but to some degree are motivated by their own selfish interests and they think that they would be better off with a raise and so they give it to themselves. Which one is the more plausible explanation for that behavior? What is a more plausible explanation for the parliamentary uh, activities uh, surrounding the practice of gerrymandering? The idea that, and I don't know if they use the same term in England, but I know the same thing happens, where they will change the borders of the electorate for each of the seats. They do this exactly the same thing in the United States in order to guarantee that this or that party will win, or at least make it much more likely. Do you believe, honestly, that that is evidence that society needs 
very convoluted, oddly drawn uh, political units uh, and governments just fulfilling that necessity or that they want to simply be reelected repeatedly and so they uh, politicize the democratic process uh, which is uh, I mean I, I don't law the democratic process but you know they, they politicize it to their own benefit I think that's a much more obvious uh, better answer and historically you know people talk about the, the governments in general states being uh, these institutions that come about for the purpose of helping other people helping society uh, we can wonder if that's theoretically possible or maybe in a hypothetical but historically that is literally never the case certainly not the case in England do you really think that the monarchy which is the root and stem of your government and I'm not saying that the, the king or queen have inordinate powers now but the, the history of the British monarchy do you think that the king and queen that the people got together and said you know we don't we we really need a monarch do you think William the Conqueror came to England because he thought they needed his help and that they that he would be able to uh, help the people of England better than Edward that nasty Edward the Confessor and uh, well that there's one Harold I guess it was after Edward the Confessor for a few months before William kicked him out no in fact William the Conqueror was explicit about it he wanted to um, take his he wanted not to benefit the people of Britain but to um, take their wealth as much of it as he possibly could and aggrandize himself in the process which he did and by your logic that's not possible if he, if anybody in the government exists then they are there to help the people and and there isn't really any evidence to this other than the fact that they probably assert this so Clement Attlee is not likely to come on and say I really think that a, a, a NHS and a bureaucracy would benefit me in some way maybe he thinks it will buy him votes maybe he thinks that it will increase contributions to him who knows He's not going to say that. He's never going to come out and say, I have selfless reasons. He's going to say, I'm doing this for your benefit. And you seem to be perfectly happy to accept that as a valid justification. That's the, all that's necessary. So when George Bush said, I'm invading Iraq because I think it's necessary, then there can't be really any debate then because he has asserted it. Hence, it is true. Right? And so, uh, and there's no non-arbitrary distinction between invading Iraq or any other foreign policy and whatever domestic policies. Both the United States and England, although England's much worse, I'm sorry to say, have gone a long way to enforce all kinds of domestic surveillance, domestic control of the populace, uh, filed uh, warrantless wiretapping, all sorts of draconian police state measures. And you are in the position of having to accept all of that is being justified because the government's doing it. It's possible that there are people in the government who actually think that it's necessary. It's also possible, and this is a possibility that you seem unaware of or convinced is, is so unlikely that you have just discounted it, it's possible that people in government act in their own self-interest and use their position in government for that end. And to me, that's not cynical, that's not outlandish, that's not libertarian bias, that's just obvious. I think we should take that for granted. If someone is coming to be a ruler over you, then you should not assume that they are altruistic in their motivations. It's possible that they are. But the burden of proof should be on them to demonstrate that. It shouldn't fall on... You should not accept that so readily. I mean... To me, that is an unbelievable degree of trust that's completely unwarranted. Governments have such a demonstrable ability to lie that for you to simply accept their benevolent uh, decl uh, declinations is just silly. Declam, declaim, that's probably not a word. So there's that. Now, then you go at some length about egalitarianism and how horrible it is to the poor uh, you said one thing um, yeah, but, but let me just sum that whole last part up though uh, 
I think it is a far better explanation of how states come about historically. And I mentioned England, but we could go back to Mesopotamia, okay? The kings of Mesopotamia, Sargon of Akkad and, and whatnot, they existed to grandize themselves. And they thought up stupid justifications on why that would be. So the pharaohs of Egypt said, the pharaohs of Egypt, they said that they were needed because if they didn't exist, the sun wouldn't rise and the Nile wouldn't flood. Okay, that's that's pure bullshit. So why did they say that? Well, because they got a pretty good deal out of it. They became the wealthiest people in history, very powerful, and it was based on bullshit. So uh, now, if you were back in Egypt, then you obviously would have accepted that and chided anyone who disagreed as being antisocial and, and failing to realize that, well, somebody has to keep the sun rising, and it's the pharaoh. How do we know? The pharaoh says so. I mean, this <laughs> it's hard not to ridicule that, that level of reasoning, so-called. Uh, anyway, there you have the pretty standard, and I find it hilarious, um, disdain for the rich. Uh, you say uh, the rich are unaffected by taxation. Uh, no, uh, that's not true. And it's also silly to think that um, turning on the taxation screws on rich only, if, you know, people have this image that like, the rich are like Scrooge McDuck. And they have a giant building that's filled with gold or money, and that if you tax some more, well, then the level of that gold simply, sh you know, goes down a little bit, and that's the only effect. Uh, and that's disingenuous because Ducktales actually had a lot more sophisticated e economic understanding in it than than that. But uh, let's say I'm wealthy, and let's say hmm, uh, twenty percent of my wealth is in mansions, twenty percent of it is in yachts, 20% of it's in all other kinds of pleasure craft and vacationing and, and you know, villas and, and speedboats and, uh, and then all the rest is, uh, you know, food and whatever. And then you can say, well, you don't need yachts and you don't need all those things, so we're going to put a 50% greater income tax on you. Uh, then I'm not the only one affected because then I'm not going to be buying I'm either going to stop buying yachts or stop buying villas or downgrade all of them. And then Every person who is has a job in some level of production to provide those goods and services, well, they're out of business too. You know, the guys who buff the deck of the boat. And I have a libertarian friend in the UK who makes a living. Um, he doesn't buff. That's probably I'm probably insulting what he does, but uh, he does wood care services and he does nice houses and well. He can fucking not have a job because the stupid um, rich people don't know how to spend the money. And and the other problem here is that the the image is that you take that money from Scrooge McDuck and say you take a million pieces of gold and then you give a million pieces of gold to the poor orphan, you know, from Charles Dixon, Dickens novels and that's what happens. No. That money is sieved through the government, which means some of it, at the very least, is lost in bureaucratic fiction, friction. People accuse libertarians of being exaggerated, exaggerating in this area, so I'm not going to give you a number because it does vary, but some of it is lost. A lot of it's going to go to mid-level bureaucrats who aren't nearly so empathetic as the stereotype typical needy person. And sometimes the amount that's lost in this process is enormous. The other part is when it's divvied out, it's divvied out politically, always. Always. It's never given, no questions asked. There's always a string attached. You have to, if you want to accept this, then you have to be this way or that way. Uh, they only give it to certain groups or certain people. They don't give it out equally. And this, this egalitarianism from people in the UK, I find utterly incomprehensible because you have a fucking monarchy just today it's been in the news that Prince Harry was in Vegas nude pictures or whatever and and I just turned on the side that he's been on a con he's been continent hopping at the fanciest hotels around does Prince Harry have a job does he make a living the only thing I've ever heard of him doing is being a soldier in her Majesty's military. So is my uh, a soldier in my grandmother's military, basically. No, he doesn't have a job. You all get to pay for him to do all this directly or indirectly. 
and he's not even the main recipient. The, the biggest wealth, welfare queen in the world is fucking Queen Elizabeth. All right, and you know what? She has the crown jewels and all those castles and who knows however much wealth. Let's just assume she doesn't have any political power, which I don't think is exactly accurate, but she just let's just think she has enormous wealth. She favors the welfare state. And in the United States, you talked about, well, you know, not everyone in the United States is libertarian. No, that's absolutely true. And you know who the main purveyors of socialism have always been in the United States? It's always been the mega rich. It's been the foundations, the Carnegie Foundation, the Rockefeller Foundation, John D. Rockefeller, Carnegie are the, are the big ones. But uh, you look at, uh, oh, J.P. Morgan, who was also a big British site, who helped us uh, help you guys fight World War I. Um, Bernard Baruch. There's a whole litany. The arch capitalists that you're, we find, you know, so archetypally American, Ayn Randian, are actually all in favor of socialism. And in England, it's a little bit more overt. You have the Fabian socialists, and all these powerful people are members of it. And they favor socialism. And it's not because they're benevolent. It's interesting. I bet if, if uh, I told you John G. Rockefeller, who uh, is listed in Wikipedia as the richest man in history, um, favors socialism, that you would maybe think he had ulterior motives. But if he was elected, well, then that would be different. Then he would only, the only way you can be elected is if you're altruistic, right? Because politicians never lie. And when they say they love someone, it must be true. And when they say that they're running to help you, and by you they mean everybody, even though people might have mutually exclusive interests, and it's, it's actually conceptually impossible for them to serve more than one person in most cir circumstances, you just accept that. They say that that's what they want to do, and that's all the evidence you need, right? That's just so inane. Uh, and and I don't know. You have a beard. I don't know how old you are, like, but even even very 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 young children understand that. You know that people can lie, and that there isn't a magical thing that means politicians or bureaucrats or any other level of government are more honest than anybody. And all the evidence I've ever seen is precisely the opposite, that they're actually more dishonest because that's what it takes. If you get out there and you are honest and you say, listen, I can't solve all your problems, there's only there's limits to what I can do, you're not going to get as many votes as the guy who promises everything to everybody. No matter how genuine, I mean, it, it can happen, but it's unusual. So politicians are just patho pathological liars, and uh, to accept their pronouncements as axiomatically valid is just it's, there couldn't be a more silly thing to believe in uh, so uh, I mean other than that uh, your juxtaposition the saying well there's the Ayn Rand free market people and then there's the free market people that just doesn't make sense because Ayn Rand was a free market person um, the Iran influence in the United States is pretty negatory in the political sense. It is mostly a it's a boogeyman that the left likes to trot out, and they like to say people believe in Ayn Rand, when very few people do. And I know Paul Ryan says he believes in it, but he doesn't vote that way. So um, it's a popular book, and it's a powerful book on the populace of the United States. But within the political elite, it has essentially zero influence other than as a prop, just like many people in the United States use the Bible as a prop. That doesn't mean that they're really practicing Christians. And I'm not a Christian, I'm agnostic, but I'm just pointing out that the politicians will say or do whatever they think will make them popular. And that doesn't mean that they actually believe it. And even accepting if, if they did, there's practically no politicians. Again, maybe Paul Ryan, maybe Ron Paul. A lot of people think Rand Paul's named after Ayn Rand. Apparently that's not true. Uh, but okay, that's three out of 400 and, or 535. It's just, it's not many. Um, and again, Ayn Rand is a free marketer, so I don't see what the distinction really is there. Uh, so you don't have egalitarianism in the UK and it's not just the queen. Tony Blair has better medical coverage than you do or any of your friends do. 
and that could be said for any number of other members of parliament or powerful people, not just the nobility. Uh, I mean, you have an explicit class society, you have a hierarchy, uh, you have divisions between rich and poor that are just as extreme as the United States, except there's even less upward mobility. And there are big problems in the United States, don't get me wrong, but uh, your fucking country is just pure bullshit at this point. Anything it had, I mean, you've abolished every every worthwhile aspect of England that has ever existed has either been completely abolished or so under siege and diminished as to be unrecognizably um, vestigial at this point. Uh, but what does that matter? So, uh, and again, I mean, I, I have a similar view of how the United States is, except just not quite as terrible. Because I've never, <laughs> people like you are, are, are fortunately ra rarer here, although they certainly exist. Uh, I don't mean that, like, to be too offensive, but, I mean, there's only so much absurdity I can take. Um, also, it's not... Libertarians oppose things like taxes and and uh, mandates that people be given things because they equate them with slavery. And the reason they do that is because in principle, in function, that is what it is. There isn't a distinction. Uh, if I come and say, okay, you, you have to pick cotton in my plantation every day and I will give you room and board because I don't want you to die because I want you to keep doing this for you know a couple of years here at least. And if you try and run away, I will punish you. I mean, you, you might manage to escape, but if I catch you, I'll probably whip you or something. I'm not going to throw you in jail because then you wouldn't be picking cotton. So I'm going to do something that's a little bit more, uh, you know, immediate to punish you. And then maybe I'll shackle you and I'm going to keep you picking cotton. And then basically the reason is because I have a right to cotton and someone has to pick it. And we don't want poor children not to go without nice cotton uniforms. So... You know, there isn't really a debate here. That's one thing. And then we could say, okay, listen, uh, I need medical care. You're a doctor. You have to give it to me. And if you don't give it to me, um, I'm not going to whip you. I'm just going to charge you with tax evasion and throw you in prison. Now, they don't do it to doctors. They just do it to the people who are forced to pay for the doctors. Although, uh, you probably have anti-striking laws and stuff uh, pertaining to doctors. And they basically say you have to pay for this service. And it's not a service if both parties don't agree. So you have to pay for this technical functioning. And if you don't, you will be punished with imprisonment, kidnapping and imprisonment. And if you resist with death, uh, that doesn't happen very often, but that's part of it. And uh, that's what libertarians have a problem with. And... That's the moral argument. Consequentialist argument, which you didn't really touch on at all, it's not simply that, oh, well, there'll be poor people and rich people, and then the rich people will just take care of the poor people. No, it's a little bit more nuanced than that. Basically, when you have a free market in goods and services, when you have competition, when you have free entry where anyone who wants to can attempt to get into that business, uh, you see two trends that are very very strong and one is that the quality of the good or service increases and usually the selection potential selection increases and the cost goes down and the price goes down as well so uh, smartphones and computers there's free markets in and they get cheaper and cheaper and cheaper and they get better and better and better and healthcare in the united states and i don't know about the uk Healthcare was getting cheaper and cheaper and cheaper, and the quality was getting better and better and better. Then the government started to get involved. And I know this is a shock, but the United States government has been heavily involved in healthcare in a, in a very big way since the 1930s, much more so since the 1960s, and at least to a degree going all the way back to the Progressive Era. Now, more than 100 years, more like 110 years now. These government activities, all of them, demonstrably raise the price. And so bitching about how expensive it is, when the price of, and here's a question for you, if the price of healthcare goes up 10%, who is hurt the most by this? The Scrooge McDuck rich people or the poor people? Poor people. So why would you favor that? Because you hate poor people. No. I mean, because you don't believe in the consequences of your actions or because you don't think there are consequences to your actions. You think that 
since a politician says the reason we're passing this bill is to help consumers and protect them, that the fact that there might be other effects of that bill, say, causing the price to go up and hurting poor people if subsequently, well, since the politician doesn't say that, then then it didn't happen. No. Uh, the price of health care has risen considerably directly as a result of government interference. Uh, and I'm not going to go into all the reasons why, but there are myriad. I mean, it's from both ends. It's from the supply side and the demands. Effective. I think I already made like fucking three hour video talking about that like two months ago. But uh, I'm not chiding you for not watching it because you never, obviously, would never have heard of it. But um, so libertarians want healthcare to be affordable, they want it to be coming higher in quality and cheaper in price, which is what would happen on a free market. So what happens to everybody else. There's no magic reason. There's no reason why this isn't the case with healthcare. It was the case with healthcare until the government decided to fuck it up. There's no, there's nothing that says consumers have to have perfect knowledge or that uh, technology is just makes it too expensive. That's just silly. Because my computer is not technological or what? I just don't understand. So um, that's it. And then that, that, also has an effect on uh, amplifying the effect of charity. So if if, if healthcare is becoming cheaper, let's just say um, the, the average healthcare costs for someone who needs it is um, two uh, thousand dollars for you know let's say if you just average the, a medical condition, say the average cost was two thousand dollars, just being totally arbitrary here, and a donor wanted to give say $10,000, then they could help five people. Well, if the price of healthcare halves to, on average, only $1,000, then that same $10,000 would help 10 people now. Now, that's just using numbers that are easy for me to do math in my head, but you get the idea. The other thing is, since the rich person wouldn't be taxed, they would have more to give. Since the poor people wouldn't be taxed, there'd actually be fewer poor people who would be in the bracket of not being able to afford their healthcare, and this is true with... Uh, middle class people as well. As it is right now, there's enough charity in the United States to equally, easily pay for all of this. Um, and that's with all the taxes. We got rid of the taxes and we had health care instead of being enormously expensive and inflated by government intervention, but rather competitively decreasing in price. It's just not an issue. Just like feeding people is not an issue. We don't need government issuing food stamps. Food is fucking free. It's so free that we have a huge weight problem Right, so that's <laughs> that's the problems we have to navigate with a free market, not that people are going to be starving in the streets and whatnot. People were starving in the streets. People were starving in the countryside on the farms in the UK when the elites were running everything, the nobility, the peasantry during feudalism. And then when you had capitalism arise, there suddenly was competition for serfs and you know your aristocracy got together and they basically invented a new kind of feudalism and it's called socialism it's not really even a secret I mean, it's just part of history so uh, whatever but I think that just the main point of this video is just to say it's just absolutely absurd to think that um, if some the government does something then it that is proof that it was necessary that the government do something. No. Government acts in its own self-interests. And those are not identical with the interests of everybody else. And in fact, if they're based on coercion, then it's demonstrably not in the best interests of everybody else. And I know that it's hard to get over years of government training to believe otherwise. I mean, you have a government-run media, you have government-run schools, as we do to a certain extent in the United States. And... Uh, That being the case, I guess I'm not that surprised that this is the argumentation I'm hearing, but oh well. All right, that's it.